crowd. You know, I'm an author. I'm, I'm used to book events. I've, I've had book events, at, at one at the Barnes & Noble up here in Portland, where no one showed up. <laughs> no, literally, I, after a couple hours, uh, finally I was packing up to go home, and a woman shuffled over, and she said, well, you signed my book. Well, you signed my book, and it was not a book that I had written. <laughs> uh, kind of puts you at that ethical crossroads. Do you, do you pretend you're the author of the book on goat cheese? Talk about your favorite goat cheeses? Or just, you know, come clean and admit you're a failed author? It actually gets more humiliating as, a, as an author. Once I wrote a book and a year later the publisher said, yeah, it's just not selling, but, but we got good news. I said, what could that possibly be? And he said, well, we have 5,000 copies in the warehouse and we'll sell them to you for 75 cents each. Apparently thinking I was going to jump up and click my heels in midair. But I said to him, well, wait a minute. What happens if I, if I don't buy those? I mean, where physically will those books go? Because I worked really hard on that book. And he goes, well, we actually have it recy recycled. And I said, In into what? And he says, well, paper towels and Kleenexes and, <laughs> and toilet paper. My book could be turned into toilet paper? He said, yeah. I said, you know, when I, when I was writing that book, I remember thinking, I want to write a book that touches people's lives in a special place. <laughs> That was not the place I had in mind. But. So anyway, all I'm saying is it's pretty cool to show up and have people actually show up. And uh, that's so. I, I've, I've got kind of an interesting medley th this morning uh, because you, you guys are awesome because you're not like uh, uh, service groups that they, they, you're on at 12 and they do the happy bucks and they do this and the announcements and by the time you get on it's a quarter to one and you got to be off by one and then everybody goes to work. And so it's very rushed and I really appreciate the fact that we have a couple of hours and so we're, we're going to break it into a couple of uh, segments. One we're going to talk about uh, Francis Langer and the American Nightingale and then Dick Fosbury, two heroes, two American heroes, but who couldn't be more different. I mean, you've got a Jew, Polish Jewish woman uh, who's long since dead uh, and, and a still living 71-year-old uh, uh, male, uh, American high jumper. Uh, and one grew up in Poland and Boston and died in Belgium. The other grew up in Medford and now lives near Sun Valley. Uh, one was not athletic at all. She was a, uh, a nurse, uh, a giver, and, and one is a, uh, an athlete and uh, a civil engineer and uh, president of the uh, American Olympic Association and Paralympic Association. So very, very two different people, but both of them, both of them left their mark uh, on our country. And, and I wrote a book once called Pebble in the Water. After I got through doing the American Nightingale story, um, I would be talking across the country and, and people would say this to me. They would say, you know, Francis Slanger's story is amazing, this nurse, uh, but, but the how you told the story, how you got your information, the people that you met, how it all worked out, that's amazing too. You ought to write a book on that. And I did. I did after American Nightingale came out, kind of an author's eye view of a four-year experience of what it was like. And, and the point, Pebble in the Water, what I, what I learned on that, what I wanted to learn on, this, on the journey was that my book was going to become a bestseller, that I was going to be able to upgrade my seats at Austin Stadium to the 50-yard line, pay off my kids' college loans. None of that happened. The book did not sell well. But here's what I learned, that we make a difference in each other's lives. And, I ha and, and, and so Pebble in the Water is a story about how a couple of hundred people put pieces in the puzzle to help me write a book called American Nightingale. And it, in a small, 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 small way, it changed the world. And it starts with Francis Slanger. So it's December 2000, and I'm at the Register Guard. I'm a columnist, and I get a call from a guy named Nathan Fendrick who puts on Holocaust and World War II uh, seminars to our high school kids in Eugene. And he says, Bob, you've, I've just stumbled upon a letter written by a Jewish World War II nurse, and you've got to write a column about her. And um, I said to him, Nathan, you know, what's, what's the local connection? I mean, does, is she from Eugene? No, no, no. She, she grew up in, in Poland and, and Boston and died in Belgium. And I said, well, where's the local connection? Because my editor wants a local connection. He goes, well, there is one. There's not one. And, and he said, but you've got to read it. And so he brings me over this letter about uh, where Francis Slanger is writing to the uh, 
uh, GIs and, and telling them what an amazing privilege it is for her as a nurse to serve them. And uh, anyway, I'm enthralled by this letter. And, and Nathan says, well, the rest of the story is that she mails the letter to the Stars and Stripes that night. And uh, the next day, the Germans uh, shell the field hospital. Three people are killed. Among them is Francis Slanger. But the newspaper, not knowing this, the Stars and Stripes newspaper publishes the letter, and it melts the hearts of thousands of GIs all over Europe. And then when they learn that she's died, it, it breaks their hearts, and they say something must be done to, uh, to honor this woman. And so basically, uh, I talked my editor into letting me write the column, um, and then I found that a woman 10 minutes from my house, she called and said, oh, you wrote about my friend Frances Slanger this morning. I said, you knew her? She said, knew her? I served with her in France. And my, my husband, John, was there. Uh, he, he was there the night that she died. And so um, gonna, we're going to show a little uh, video here that will give you an overview of who Francis Slanger was and, and sort of how the story uh, unfurled. On June 10, 1944, at this exact spot, 18 women of the U.S. Army Nurse Corps jumped out of a landing craft in combat fatigues. They were the first nurses to step foot in France during World War II. In the months to come, these nurses toiled in obscurity, helping save the lives of wounded soldiers as American troops battled German forces. One such nurse would touch the hearts of thousands of American GIs like no other. Her name was Frances Slanger. She was the first American nurse to die after the landings at Normandy. The idea for American Nightingale came in December of 2000 when a man named Nathan Fendrick, who puts on World War II and Holocaust seminars in our community, uh, called me at work and said, I've stumbled across this beautiful letter this nurse wrote. You've got to write a column about Francis Slanger. When I read this letter, I was so moved by it that I, I knew I had to try and get her letter, these words, onto the Second World War Memorial that's being built in Washington, D.C. I fought the battle for a year to get this letter in stone on that monument. Well, I didn't pull it off. I ran into too much bureaucracy. But there was this guy at the register guard named Bob Welsh, and he took an interest. And then he spent two years of his life writing a book about it. It is 0200 and I have been lying awake for one hour, listening to the steady, even breathing of the other three nurses in the tent. Franz Slanger, on a stormy night in 1944, sat down in her tent in the 45th Field Hospital and wrote this unbelievable letter. The rain is beating down with a torrential force. The fire is burning low, and just a few live coals are on the bottom. The slow feeding of wood and finally coal, a roaring fire is started. I couldn't help thinking how similar to a human being a fire is. If it is allowed to run down too low, and if there is a spark of life left in it, it can be nursed back. So can a human being. It is slow. It is gradual. It is done all the time in these field hospitals. I think what provoked the letter was that uh, some, some of the GIs, some of the soldiers, had written in the Stars and Stripes, which was the Army uh, newspaper, praising the nurses 
saying things like bouquets for you all, all kinds of things like that. But Frances Slinger didn't see it that way. She said, us? No, 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 no. You're the heroes, not us. This time we're handing out the bouquets, but after taking care of some of your buddies, seeing them when they are brought in, bloody, dirty with the earth, mud, and grime, and most of them so tired. Somebody's brothers, somebody's fathers, and somebody's sons. Seeing them gradually brought back to life, to consciousness, and to see their lips separate into a grin when they first welcome you. Usually they kid, hurt as they are. It doesn't amaze us to hear one of them say, how you babe? But the wounded do not cry. I found when, when people hear the phrase World War II nurse, they seem to think about uh, nurses in a, a beautiful hospital in France wearing, and they're wearing white dresses and white caps, strolling across some well-shined linoleum in a French hospital. And the army tried to sell it as, as almost a, a glamorous thing. They showed these pictures of uh, women in tents as if they were having a slumber party. But when the 45th Field Hospital arrived at Normandy four days after D-Day, they were wearing three-pound steel helmets, army fatigues. There were bodies rolling up in the surf. They were greeted by literally 17 truckloads of wounded soldiers. The 45th Field Hospital would travel 600 miles. They would treat nearly 5,000 patients and watch 223 soldiers die. It was four months into the journey when Slanger wrote her letter to Stars and Stripes. Uh, next morning, she mailed it. And the following night after that, uh, there was a German barrage, an enemy barrage of artillery, artillery fire. And some of the shells hit the 45th Field Hospital. Three people were killed, a major, a private, and the second lieutenant nurse, Francis Slanger. that night very vividly yeah because yeah, my immediate commanding officer in my platoon was killed and a couple of enlisted men were killed Francis yeah it was terrible soon after Welch's column about the nurse appeared in the register guard newspaper in December 2000 he got a call from a woman named Sally Lou Bonzer who said she'd been a nurse with Slanger in France and her husband John had been a doctor in Slanger's very platoon. Francis Slanger was born in Poland, grew up in Boston, and died in Belgium. And yet here is this nurse in, in Eugene, Oregon, 10 minutes from my house, who had served with this woman in World War II, who still had the original letter from Francis Slanger as it appeared in Stars and Stripes newspaper, who had some phone numbers of other nurses who still were alive and living on the East Coast. That afternoon, I was up at her house going through this uh, photo album as, as if I was on sort of a journalistic treasure hunt. And I left her house that day absolutely committed to telling the story of Francis Slanger. She was very bright. She was very quiet. She didn't really mingle real well with the nurses, but she had her own idea of what had to be done. She did what had to be done. She was very serious, uh, very serious, and she worried about the GIs, really. She, she uh, was uh, about, they, it bothered her, you know, bothered her. There, there's something about this woman that, that really drew us to her. And I think the reason is, uh, is best described in the words of a New York radio commentator in 1945, when he said that this is a story of an army nurse that surpasses anything Hollywood has ever dreamed of. And he was right, but he was right because the story was true and it was unadulterated by screenwriters of the patriotic fervor of the time. In Boston South End, she was known as the fruit peddler's daughter, but Frances Langer wanted to be more than that. She wanted to make a difference in the world. Everywhere she turned, people said, no, 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 you can't make a difference. She wanted to be a, a nurse as a young girl, but her parents said, no, that's not for a Jewish girl. But she persevered and, and went to nursing school, and her supervisor said, no, 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 you can't become a nurse. You're too headstrong, but she became a nurse. And she joined the Army Nurse Corps and wanted to serve overseas on the front lines. And her supervisor said, no, no, you have bad eyesight. You need to stay stateside. But she talked her way into being overseas with the soldiers that she wanted to serve. That was her ultimate calling. Once the Second World War ended, 
people forgot about Frances Langer as they did about most people who died in the war. And for that reason, her story is, is once again a new one, and it's an interesting one. It was here, in farmland only miles from the German border, where Frances Langer died on October 21st, 1944. Meanwhile, though, the Stars and Stripes newspaper, not realizing that she had died, published a letter she had written as a guest editorial. Thus far in the war, only one non-reporter had been allowed access to that particular space in the paper, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. I believe Frances Slanger's story is important in our Me First world because she reminds us that honor comes not from money, fame, beauty, or power. Honor comes from the giving of ourselves to something greater than ourselves. This spring, America will dedicate the long-awaited World War II Memorial and commemorate the 60th anniversary of D-Day. In a sense, this will be the last hurrah for a World War II generation that sacrificed so much. I believe stories like Slangers must be remembered, not only for what they teach us about sacrifice, but for what they teach us about triumph. Because Slanger's story was really a story of triumph. You see, the soldiers that she wrote about, the soldiers that she served so well, didn't forget about her. Her letter to Stars and Stripes and her subsequent death triggered scores of heartfelt letters from soldiers all across Europe. Inspiration is difficult to discover. We discovered it. Amid the roar and thunder of war emerges at one time or another the genuine worth living for thoughts of a human being. Only few people can put it on paper. But all of us have that singular infinite thought deep in our minds and hearts. Francis Slanger put it on paper. So overwhelmingly beautiful, yet so much from the heart. If it is humanly possible to preserve her memory, we suggest naming a hospital ship in her honor. So when this terrible holocaust is over, we can carry her ideals into a world of peace. And we knew there wasn't a false word in the letter. We knew it for our world, and we grinned in appreciation, knowing that we read the letter of a girl already dead, and her words fixed beyond alteration. They were sealed with her blood. After her death, the war went on without Francis Slinger, the Battle of the Bulge, the discovery of slave labor camps in Germany full of dead and dying Jewish people, and finally the end of war in Europe and the end of suffering for many. Six weeks later, the United States commissioned a hospital ship, the largest and finest of its kind. It was named for a fruit peddler's daughter, a woman who wanted to make a difference, a woman who blew on the embers of soldiers' lives. A woman whose forgotten legacy will be unveiled this spring in a book, American Nightingale, whose release coincides with a nation's final farewell to a generation that must not be forgotten. The, uh, so I had all this enthusiasm for wanting to write this book, but I really didn't know where to begin. And uh, so, yeah, we'll just do that in the second segment. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, doesn't need to be ready. Um, okay. So, but, so the, 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 I had the story. I had the nugget of the story, but I didn't even know where to begin. So I basically called, I knew that she had uh, never married, but her sister uh, had and um, so I started looking for all the Sidmans in the Boston phone book one Sunday afternoon and uh, on the tw I, I made 20 phone calls talked to a lot of nice people named Sidman none of whom were related to Francis Slanger on the 21st call uh, a, a woman dropped the phone and she said Stanley there's a man out there in Oregon who wants to write a book on Francis and so she, her husband was a cousin of three Slanger nephews who I found were still living, two in the Boston area, one in Florida. And uh, so that's how I began my search for Francis Slanger. And uh, um, I finally got a hold of Irwin Sidman that night. He said, I had been eight years old when the Western Union telegram man showed up in 1944 to tell me that my aunt had died. And he said she would make an amazing book. She, she was ama an amazing person, a giver in a world of takers. And so I said, well, that's wonderful. Is there, how much information is there? That's what I need to know. And he goes, well, there's like three suitcases full. And I go, great, where are they? He says, I know, I have no idea. 
no idea. And so it took me about six weeks of, of searching for the three suitcases. He thought they were at the Smithsonian. He thought they were maybe at the Jewish uh, uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. And frankly, um, finally found a, a, a guy had written a book called uh, Hospital Ships of World War II. And in that book, there was a lot of uh, interesting childhood information about Slanger, and I, my instincts as a journalist said, that's got to be the suitcase information. So I got a hold of that author, God bless the internet, and uh, in Jupiter, Florida, and I said, sir, can I ask where you got your information? And he said, oh, the uh, Boston University Archives has 15 lineal feet on Francis Slanger. But that doesn't mean it's great information. Uh, I'm, I'm in Eugene, that's Boston, and so I have a friend at the paper who has a cousin who lives in Boston, and I paid her $100 to go to the archives and report back what was in the archives. And she wrote back and said, nah, there's not enough for a book here, just a bunch of letters and some books and stuff like that. So at that point, I was ready to quit, and my wife Sally, who is always my encourager, said, mm, you sure? And so I booked a flight to Boston. I flew back and I looked at it myself. There was plenty of information, or at least to get, to get going, a toehold, as it were. And, uh, and so then I, I, I placed an ad in the Boston uh, uh, Globe. Does anybody remember Francis Slanger, uh, World War II nurse, died in 1944? Uh, it was a $145 ad. I waited weeks and weeks, nothing. No response. And finally, a, a letter with chicken scratch writing, a man said, I remember Frances Slanger. Uh, her father and my father were fruit peddlers together in the 30s. Uh, I, I know her well enough to remember her Yiddish name. And uh, so his name was, um, it escapes me right now because it's been 15 years from that. I'm starting to forget things. But anyway, oh, Milton Zola, Milton Zola. So I call, I, I call Milton Zola. And he's not in. And I call him the next day. He's not in. Call him the next day. He's not in. And I go, what did he do? Like write the letter and die? You know, it's not like, you know, he, was, he had to be at least 80, 85. It's not like he was heading off to watch the Red Sox in spring training every year. So I, I keep calling him every single day. No answer. No answer. Then I start thinking that maybe he's in a, maybe he had to go into an assisted living home or nursing home. So literally, I'm calling nursing homes in his area. You know, I can see where he lives. Nothing. I call him for 30 straight days. Nothing. Finally, 31st day, Milton Zola. I said, where have you been? He says, who's this? <laughs> I said, Bob Welch out in Oregon. You wrote me. You, know, you knew Francis Slanger. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm sorry I haven't been around. Me and the missus, we go to Florida every year to watch the Red Sox in spring training. <laughs> there I go, you know. There's... So anyway, Milton Zola unlocked her childhood for me because he had known her as a young man. And uh, actually, when he was in his 20s, she had taken care of him when he was in the hospital for something. And so uh, I went back there, and, and somebody had told me um, the area that she lived in now was so dangerous, I'd want a police escort. And, uh, and I actually worked through the Eugene police to get a, a police escort with the Boston police so I could just see where she lived. And I told that to Milton Zola. I said, you don't need no police escort. And when I flew back there, he said, get in the car. You know, they don't have cars in Boston. They have cars. And I got in the car. And uh, the, 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 the scariest thing in my four years of this journey w was definitely Milton Zola's driving. But... <laughs> But we did see where Francis Sanger grew up, and, and the story started to emerge. And then, but then I kept thinking, you know, the one thing I don't have, do I, do I really have the evidence that she really made a difference? I mean, yeah, there were, we have Associated Press reports that letter, letters, soldiers wrote letters to her, but I've only seen two of those letters. And so I need more. I need more. So I went to the um, uh, Library of Congress and, uh, uh, and the National Archives, and at the National Archives, it was just it was uh, just a sea of information, a sea of confusion. I had one day to, to work there, and I was getting nowhere. After a few hours, I, I finally went down the hallway to the one contact I had. I said, I've got all these index numbers, but I don't even know where to go from here. And this guy said, come here. And he, we got in the elevator, and he, we went down into the bowels of the National Archives, and he pressed these buttons, and like the parting of the Red Sea, these stacks of, of files moved left and right, and he looked at my number, and he pulled out a file, and, and he, hadn't never, he hadn't looked at this before, but he said, well, is this anything you could use? And I opened it up. There were hundreds of letters from GIs written 
uh, to the Stars and Stripes about Francis Slanger's initial letter and about Francis Slanger's death. And I said, gold mine, and I started, I pulled my laptop out and started doing that. He goes, no, 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 you got two hours before we close. Just get this card, just start copying these off. So I started copying them off, and I remember flying home that night and thinking, sometime, speaking of, of pebbles in the water, uh, sometime at the, at, when the war ended and they were closing up the Stars and Stripes newspaper in Paris, France, someone had the presence of mind to say, let's save these letters. These are too important to throw away. And somehow they got into the National Archives. And I often wondered if I was the first person that ever looked at them. Uh, I, I would assume so. But anyway, we talk about making a difference in the world. And sometimes, and, and sometimes we think that's reserved for the rich and the famous and the powerful people in the world. But it's us. It's us at, at, at street level. At, at, at neighborhood level, at family level, that, that we can make a difference. Because somebody back there put a pebble in the water and those ripples went far. Because I probably, I'm not sure I could have told the story without those, those letters. Because they substantiated what a, a difference that she had made. And so anyway, uh, we're, we're rolling along. I'm taking all my vacation time to spend writing, working on the book. And, and uh, one year passes and another. And then we decide, I decide, that, that Sally and I need to go to France. We've got to walk on the same beach that the, they came ashore at, Utah Beach. We need to find the field where she died. Uh, obviously, a lot will have changed in almost 60 years, but we've got to, we've got to go there. And we go there. And the first place we went was a place called Orador sur Glen, which we had learned on the same day that the 45th Field Hospital landed at Normandy Beach, at, at Utah Beach. Uh, 200 miles away, the Germans came into a small village, and in retaliation for uh, uh, some uh, misdeeds, perceived misdeeds from the French resistance, the Germans killed 642 men, women, and children in this village and then burned it to the ground. And, and I wanted to include it in the book, not that it happened, not that the 45th Field Hospital met any of these soldiers, but that it happened at the same moment that they came ashore. And it reminds us of it, what they were up against. This is the kind of evil that was being meted on, on uh, Europe at the time. And uh, Sally and I just drove away from that experience. They, they basically uh, cordoned off that village and turned it into a shrine and then built an entire new village. And, and now you can tour the old village and you see sewing machines that never sewed a dress again or little uh, children's bicycles that no kid ever rode again. Watches that were stopped at 2.10 p.m. on June 10th, 1944. Uh, and we just drove away from there, heading toward Normandy that afternoon, just in stunned silence. And, and, and I remember this Frenchman, as we were walking out of there, just muttered, man's inhumanity to man. And yet we were just about, uh, uh, little did we know that uh, even as we were uh, driving to Normandy, uh, the continuance of that was at work back in America because we went to dinner that night and an Irishman leaned over and he said to us, excuse me, you're Americans, aren't you? And we said, we were. He said, did you hear what happened in your country today? And it was 9-11. And uh, we couldn't believe it. We, we raced back up to our rooms, turned on the television, and saw the Twin Towers collapsing. And uh, we're just reminded that um, the people change, the the, 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 the ways of killing one another changes, but man's inhumanity to man, unfortunately, continues. Because here we were, here, hearing the waves lap ashore outside of our hotel room at Normandy, uh, and then seeing on TV the images of the, of the destruction in New York and the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. And uh, it was just a, a kind of a surreal experience. And, and as we, the next day, went to the cemetery, any of you who watched the movie Saving Private Ryan will remember the movie starts out in a cemetery above Omaha Beach. And uh, I had not, it, it had not sunk into me yet. And yet, and we were walking through and just seeing all the white crosses, all the stars of David's, of all the dead. And suddenly the chimes started playing, my country, tis of thee. And I broke down and wept. And, 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 
everywhere we went uh, during that time, the, 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 the French and the, the British who were, there, were, there was a British school group visiting a, a museum that we were in, they, they accorded us so much respect, it was amazing. Um, and the, the, the French had, taught, had, had wrapped black bunting around uh, the American flags and hung it from their windows. And as, everywhere we drove in France, uh, we were reminded that people cared about uh, America and, and our loss and losses. So anyway, um, in fact, we got to the uh, uh, cemetery where Francis Langer was initially buried. And uh, this, this man came up, and he's speaking a language we did not understand. And in this part of Europe, you don't know whether it's French, German, Flemish, Dutch, who it could be anything, because you're kind of at these crossroads of all these countries. And, and uh, finally, we understood what it was. And, and the, the uh, caretaker of the cemetery told us, that the man brought these flowers, and they were uh, they weren't for any one soldier. They were for America, uh, for for its loss. And and this was he was German, and very well was of the age that he could have fought in World War II. And we thought it was hopeful that here was a guy who uh, may well have fought in World War II against the uh, the Americans, and yet he wanted these flowers at the base of the American flag in honor of America's loss. So, anyway. Um, finally, the, the, the book is pretty much done, um, so I send it, I, 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 I start searching for an agent, somebody who will represent me, like somebody who, a realtor, somebody who will sell my house, right? Except mine's, I've got a book, 26 turndowns, 26 people said no. So I come up to Portland, go to the Willamette Writers Workshop, and uh, you, you pay $15 for a 10-minute slice of time with an agent, and uh, the first guy I met with, Ted Weinstein of San Francisco, fell in love with the story. He, he said, I'd be honored to represent you, and he had it sold to Simon & Schuster within a month. And so um, things are happening, the book's going to be coming out, and uh, then I realized that Simon & Schuster is going to do nothing to promote the book. And I'm kind of a uh, get it done sort of guy, and so I said, what can we do? And my, at the time, my, my son, who's about 23 or 4, he had a friend who was a, b beginning to be a pharmaceutical salesman. He said, you know, I can't get the doctors to listen to me at all, but if I show them a DVD, I have a chance. And I said, that's it. Let's make a DVD about Francis Langer. Well, you just saw it. Um, so my son and I and my, both of my sons and I made that in about four days. We went to, um, I had some footage from, from Normandy. And then we went over to Florence, Oregon, which looks a lot like there's, if you go just north of Florence, it looks a lot like Utah Beach. So that place where, that place where I'm standing, where I actually did the interview, that is Florence. Uh, anyway, um, and we dressed up my sons, that, you know, it's the first time I'd seen my kids smoke a cigarette down in our basement. You know, we dressed up like my sons as soldiers. My daughter-in-law became the arm of of uh, Francis Slanger with some T-111 siding in the background, which you probably would not have seen in, uh, in Normandy in 1944. Um, and they got the smoke machine going, and, and we got this thing done. And we, we made 200 copies and sent it to editors and TV producers and heard absolutely nothing, <laughs> nothing. And then I'm driving down the freeway near Eugene when I get a call from Dr. Timothy Johnson, the ABC medical editor, who, in, who invites us to be on Good Morning America. He said, I've, I've watched your DVD. It was amazing, and we think this is a great story. So we go back to Boston and uh, get interviewed by Timothy Johnson. And uh, I'm kind of thinking, wow, everything's coming together. We've got the perfect book. Uh, and we've got the World War II Memorial is going to be unveiled in May, and we've got the uh, six year anniversary of D-Day, and we're on Good Morning America. This is looking really good. And uh, anyway, after the interview, Timothy Johnson says to me, he goes, you know, that, that, that DVD really impressed me. He said, how much did you pay for that, to have, to have that done? And I said, mm, I'm thinking like $14.95. <laughs> and he goes, he said, you had that thing made for less than $1,500? And I said, no, less than 15. Uh, it was, I mean, like 14 dollars that's what it call, cost for the black felt to, uh, to make our kitchen look like a, a, a studio. And he just laughed. And I said, there's that one part where Nathan Fendrick's talking about the night Francis Slanger died, and you hear this, and you think it's the wump of guns in the distance. No, it's our cat scratching. She wanted in. So. <laughs>
<clears throat> so anyway, then, uh, so, so we're getting closer to the release date, and I, I find out that the book's going to come out in May of 2004. I wanted it to come out in January because all of this stuff, the, the celebrations of the uh, World War II Memorial and D-Day are all happening in May and June. And I'm thinking if we get the book out in January, it gets some legs, people hear about it, so that when 100,000 soldiers come into Washington, D.C., you can sell some books. And my editor tells me none is coming out in uh, late May. I, go, I said, Brenda, that's too late. That's too late. And she said, sorry, that's when it's coming out. So I texted her and I said, you know, I've been thinking it over. Having it come out in June is like showing up at a New Year's Eve party at about 1130 and hoping that you could find someone and get to know them well enough to kiss them at midnight. <laughs> and she wrote back and said, Bob, your idea of having the book come out in January is like showing up for the New Year's Eve party about 930 AM, drinking all day, throwing up all over your dress and making a fool of yourself. I knew we were going to have a great relationship after our, that exchange. But, but the reality is we showed up for the party at about 1130, and we couldn't find anyone to kiss. And, and we did get on Good Morning America. Uh, unfortunately, Ronald Reagan then died. And we were bumped off all of the uh, time zones except for the East Coast. And so the book really never got the traction that we'd, we'd hoped for. But, but what I learned in the process is that, that life, I was reminded that life's about more than money and life's more than about fame. And it's really about people and relationships. And um, because so many people had come along and helped me on this journey. I think there's 200 people in the acknowledgments. And at some point, uh, right before the book was coming out, I said, you know, we ought to honor the nurses who are still left. There's four out of the 18 still living. Sally Lou Bonzer lives here in Eugene. The other three are back east. We could, we could honor the people who helped us on the book, some of the captains, the male captains who were part of the 45th Field Hospital. Let's have a little gig back in D.C., like a cookies and punch thing. You know, at Joseph Shoham, uh, who was a captain in the 45th, at his... Uh, um, you know, condominium or his little community club or whatever. And, and Sally goes, well, how much do you think that would cost? And I'm going, well, I don't know, maybe three or $400. And she said, well, yeah, I think we, we should do that. And so anyway, I sent out invitations to the, I think, a bunch of people and said, would you come and, and would your adult children come to something like this? Because these are all World War II people. And we get 55 yeses. We, I mean, there'd be 55 people coming to this event. So I switch it to a, a hotel in Arlington, Virginia, and I decide we're going to have a big banquet on the 60-year anniversary of, of the day that these women were among the first uh, nurses to step foot in France. And the next day, we're going to rent a bus, and we're going to tour the World War II memorial um, that their generation's blood basically paid for. And Sally, I'm on the phone to the hotel. I remember trying to decide between the beef and the fish and what, the vegetarian or whatever. And Sally just goes, who's paying for all this? <laughs> and I told her, I said, you know, I just, I just figure it will work out. It will work. If you do good stuff, it will work out, which is my euphemistic way of saying Uncle Visa will pay for it. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, then a week later, I met, the, uh, I met a group just like this in Eugene. And uh, Eugene's not a big pro-war place. And I'm talking about a World War II nurse and telling the story that I just told you. And we get to the question answer period and I say, are there any more questions? And a woman stands up and she goes, I have a question. I said, what's that? She goes, how can we give to the banquet fund? And I said, well, there is no banquet fund. She leans down, pulls out a checkbook, and says, guess what? There is now. And she writes me a check on the spot for 350 bucks. And another woman stands up and says, my husband fought in the Battle of the Bulge. I want to give money in his honor. Someone else says, I want to give too. I come home that evening, and I open up my little DVD case, and there's $1,400 in cash and checks. And Sally goes, what did you do, rob a bank? <laughs> I said, no, I didn't even ask for it. They just gave it to me. And so in the end, the band quit. Uh, at one point, I, I spoke to a business group another week later, a business group, people that are about making money, not giving money, right? And I tell them the story, and a woman comes up, slips me a $500 check, and she goes, Lane Forest Products is paying for the bus. Stuff like that. So in the end, they whole, the whole thing cost $3,200, and uh, I never asked for a cent, and I never gave a cent of my own money. It all came uh, almost down to a dime from people who caught the vision and wanted to be part of it. And, and, and uh, that night was so special. It was um, you know, Ronald Reagan's body was lying in state across the river. And we were um, 
we were having this little banquet and uh, uh, these adult children were getting to see their mothers for the first time honored for what they did. And the US Army Nurse Corps showed up. I had one connection in Washington, DC, but this guy knew everybody and he put this together and, and they all got, uh, were awarded uh, uh, ribbons in, on, on behalf of the US government. And uh, it was just a special, special night. And so the, the, I think the legacy, the, the, the lesson from um, American Nightingale is, is like I said, that we do make a difference because Francis Langer at one point was a scared little seven-year-old girl showing up at Ellis Island. She had left Poland and, and she didn't have a, a, she hadn't been let into America because she had an eye infection. And when you have a, when you're being detained at Ellis Island in those times, you are often placed in a cage. And uh, so if you can imagine a seven-year-old girl, girl who doesn't have a country and a, she really doesn't have a family because she's been separated from them, her mom and her sister, and she's in a cage, she hardly has any human, standing, she's almost being treated like an animal. You would never have thought, wow, there's somebody who's going to grow up and make a huge difference in the world. And yet, that letter changed the hearts of, uh, of thousands of, of GIs. And a, and a ship is named in her honor, and a book is written about her. And uh, every now and then, I get a letter from somebody who says, I just graduated from nursing school. And I went because of the inspiration of Francis Slanger. And I'm honored to be the one that got to be the conduit, got to be the one to tell her story so stuff like that happens. And so all of these good things happening, the, 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 the women being honored back in DC, people being inspired by Francis Slanger's story, it all living on, it, but it all goes back to Francis Slanger living that story and giving her life for this country. And so that to me, uh, you know, as I, as I look at a picture here of, of Dick Fosbury going over a high jump bar, I, I think how different they are, but then I think how similar they are in that both of them were people who you never would have thought were gonna make a huge difference. And after our Q&A period, we'll talk about Fosbury's story, but um, I guess the lesson I wanna leave with you is never doubt uh, what one person can do, because Frances Langer was the least likely to, to make a real big impact on the world, and yet she did. Um, see, in the, see in the video, I have not seen it in literally years, to be honest with you, because I'm off doing, uh, talking about other books, but seeing the picture of Sally Lou Bonzer, uh, Sally Lou Bonzer was sort of the uh, life of the party sidekick to a very serious Francis Langer. Francis Langer was always reading a book or writing. She was not the one who was going at Fort Bragg, going out to the bar. She was busy writing back at, at the uh, base and stuff like that. But Sally Lou Bonzer, the woman from Eugene who was my connection, she was at the bar. <laughs> she was the life of the party. She was the woman who, when they when the 45th Field Hospital finally got a break just short of the Belgium-German border, where Slanger died actually, um, one morning uh, all of a sudden a bunch of GIs started a, a sort of a, a tongue to the top of their mouth uh, uh, and they surrounded Sally Lou's tent and all of a sudden, boom, out she popped wearing a bikini made from a Nazi flag. That was Sally Lou Bonzer, and uh, uh, last Wednesday she turned 100. She's the last remaining, she's the only one, I, to, to my knowledge, she's the only one from the 45th Field Hospital still alive. And yet, you know, there's a front page story in the Register Guard, and so the whole story of the 45th Field Hospital slanger, it, it continues on, and we're reminded that, um, that those women weren't wearing white dresses and shuffling around a nice little French hospital. They were sleeping in foxholes and, and wiping the blood off of a saw that just took a soldier's leg off. Uh, and more than anything, they were encouragement. They were encouraging men who were on the brink of death. And uh, lots of stories in the book about guys who uh, would wake up and the, only, the first person they saw would be a nurse. And, and, and one, one guy says, just touches her hand and said, I just, I just want to make sure you're real and you're not an angel. And so with that, um, I, I'd like to segue into your questions that you might have about uh, the Francis Slanger story about American Nightingale, and then we'll what take a little break and come back and and talk about a totally different sort of American hero, Dick Fosbury. But question, oh, thank you, thank you.
Yes, yes, ma'am, over here. Okay. My name is Pat, and this is Small World Department. 1966, I was in uh, getting my nursing degree at the Mayo Clinic, and that summer we had adjunct faculty come and give the history of nursing. So I saw the whole letter from and heard the whole story. Wow. And it was a very different experience because we were in the middle of Vietnam. or we getting right. really big time in Vietnam. That's so interesting. Different conversation. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. Uh-huh. Yeah. <clears throat> this is Bob. Um, this is, I guess, maybe more of a comment than a question, but if you want to react to it. Okay. Uh, one of our takeaways from a visit to Normandy that I think is kind of an untold story is the number of French civilians that were killed in that campaign. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the village that the Nazis destroyed, but mm -hmm. literally thousands of French civilians yes. died. Um, and, you know, I think as Americans, we tend to focus on, you know, the American experience, but I think it's worth remembering what they went through. Mill millions of Europeans, of citizens, died in World War II. Um, and there's, there's a chapter in the book where actually the death of a young French girl sort of puts Joseph Shoham, or um, no, another, another uh, captain, just kind of pushes him over the edge. He, he's having a hard enough time dealing with the death of soldiers, but when he sees this little uh, French girl brought in on, the, on, on a, uh, uh, I think they brought her in on a door, it just broke his heart, and he, he has a melt, just a, a complete breakdown at that point. Slanger comes up and, and puts a, a farm fresh egg in his hand to encourage him. A, a farm fresh egg in Normandy in those days was just like gold. Mm -hmm. but, other questions? Yes. Not a question. This is Eunice. I remember when you were here, it's been a few years ago, and you talked about Francis Slanger. Would, I think it was 2005. I, it was oh, year. it could have been. Yeah. Um, I did get the book uh, from the library, I believe. Don't ever get it from the library. <laughs> <laughs> hey. No, just kidding. And uh, also the Pebble one, I have read Pebble that. Pebble in the Water. And I would certainly encourage all of you to read them. Not from the library, though. <laughs> no. I just kid. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, hi, Bob. This is Don. Huh? Um, I couldn't help uh, thinking as you're telling this story of man's inhumanity to man and children in cages that, that we kind of have something like that going on right now. Right. And uh, we're starting to act like the Germans. So I, I just, uh, you know, I, I guess there's not a question there, but... If you want to comment, please do. I, I, I think it's it's true. I, I wish I wish you could say that history changes. Um, and uh, um, but I but in my, in my Fosbury story, you know, we we talk about Tommy Smith and John Carlos raising their fists in Mexico City uh, in protest of of racial discrimination, and yet you see a lot of you see a lot of similarities between what happened then and what's happening now, and so. Uh, I, I, I'm an optimist, and I'm hopeful, and I'm reading John, listening to John Meacham's book. Um, what's it, somebody remind me of the name of it? Better Angels. Better Angels. Yeah, I was listening to it all my way all the way up this morning, and and he talks about how throughout history, uh, the dark sides always are are r raising the, you know raising its head and and wreaking evil on the world, and yet and yet we keep. We have this hope, and we keep bouncing back, and the better angels ultimately come and sort of save the day. And that's how it is in history. Um, so hopefully there will be some better angels, you know, that, that, that will be happening now, too. Yes. Hi, my name is Franca. Um, we had a speaker here a while back on Marilyn Johnson. She talked about her mother, who was a, um, a Navy wave. Mm -hmm. And she's Jewish, and so she um, experienced uh, anti-Semitism, which I, you know, the, the military is not immune to that. So uh, since she was Jewish, do you think that affected any of her life, her decisions, whatever happened to her? Yeah. Um, Francis Slanger, the, the evidence of Francis Slanger being um, 
the target of anti-Semitism, not a whole lot of evidence, but, the, but certainly at, there was institutional uh, uh, discrimination. They could have only so many Jews uh, in, in the school of nursing, uh, a black woman, uh, I mean, I, I have transcripts in the book about how a black woman uh, applied, and, and they were very skeptical about this. Uh, could we really let her in? And so, yeah, there, that went on, definitely. But, but in terms of when the, once they were part of their unit, was there uh, anti-Semitism going on? Not a whole lot of evidence that it was. I think that war sometimes can bind people together. One thing is you have a common purpose. And, you're, and, and these people's purpose was to save lives. It was a very noble purpose. And so at one point, Francis Slanger, of course, whose family is being systematically murdered back in Poland, um, is confronted with taking care of a German soldier. Sometimes the, the uh, field hospitals would take care of the enemy. And she was in charge of taking care of this guy. And she, people, the evidence was that she, she did it with, with the same uh, integrity that we, she would if it were an American soldier, which uh, to me, that, that's uh, amazing character for someone to value someone whose who's country, you know, uh, is, is systematically murdering your people. Uh, amazing that they, she could overcome that kind of thing. Someone else? Hmm. You, sir, and then her? Uh, my name is Don. I believe the first nurse killed in Vietnam was at the 91st evacuation hospital in July. It was during the Tet Offensive, uh, a rocket hit the Vietnamese ward. I served there in 69-70, she died in 68. But I can assure you that the tradition of compassion and caring with the women that served in Vietnam continued. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm actually, my next book is going to be on a Vietnam nurse, and that, that story is in my book, because um, she talks about it. How, how, as a nurse, when she heard that this nurse had been killed, um, it's called My Two Wars, um, and, it's, and it's really about a Vietnam nurse who then later fought the 10-year fight to have the Women's Memorial put in at the, uh, at the wall in D.C. And if you think there's... Uh, sexism going on now, wait until you hear a senator say something like, well, if we're going to let the women have a memorial, what, what's next? Are we going to let the scout dogs have a memorial? That kind of level of sexism. So it's a very interesting story about a woman who simply would not let go of her quest to see that women were, were honored for what they did in Vietnam. Ma'am, did you have a question? Yeah, but I'm taking my turn. Like, oh, okay. Okay, back here. Okay. Uh huh. My name is Charlene. I want to thank you. I found that as you started to speak, I saw this sort of as a memorial for the people that died a few days ago. Mm. And, you know, the fact that she was Jewish and the fact that she served others. And I thought about the man who did all the murdering the other day was served in a Jewish hospital by a Jewish doctor. Right. And I just felt that the timing of your being here, thank you so much. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Um, yeah. She wrote a letter uh, to get into the School of Nursing, and she said, I've always wanted to serve those who are less fortunate than me. This woman, her, her family never owned a house. They never owned a car. They were poor. And Frances Langer kind of became the breadwinner. In other words, she was pretty less fortunate to begin with, and yet she had this heart. For others, T Timothy Johnson said, what's the one question you would ask Frances Langer were she still living? And I said, where did that come from? How could you grow up in such squalor? Uh, she grew up amid World War I, which uh, came to her city in Poland, Wuj, Poland, and, and all that she experienced, and yet she had this heart for others. And I just wanted to know, how, how are you not bitter? Why were you not looking at yourself as a victim, but instead looking at how can I help others? I, and I've never figured that one out. Yes. Um, Gretchen, I'm so impressed with the research you did and that you didn't give up and all, you know, the, the thrill of finding the, her story. Um, in your research of her life, were there relatives that she left behind and, or that her family left behind in Poland that might have been victims of the Holocaust? Everyone in her family died in the Holocaust, except for one person, yeah. So, so 
that was on her mind while she yeah, was serving. Yeah, she, uh, in her scrapbook in the late 30s, she was clipping out stories about Adolf Hitler as if she almost had a sixth sense, like, like as if she re realized that he was bad news. And I have to tell you that not all America, they weren't particularly concerned about Adolf Hitler in the late 30s. There were a lot of people, you know, the German culture was a revered culture, uh, music and, and, and uh, art, and, uh, and a lot of people were slow to wake up to the evils of Adolf Hitler. She, but it was interesting because she cut these things out as a 25-year-old a woman and placed them in a scrapbook about Hitler, you know, is, is a threat to the Jews and stuff. And she seemed to be a little bit ahead of her times. Yes. Thank you so much. We'll take the break now okay. and look All forward right. to the next. Thank you. It's from uh, um, uh, 60, 60 years ago to actually uh, uh, a little more than 60 years ago to 50 years ago. It was 50 years ago last... Um, um, let's see here. Can somebody show me which, what I'm supposed to do to move my slides? <laughs> it all happened so fast. Um, so we switch from... You can use this or you can use this. Okay, one. good. Okay, so uh, 50 years ago on October 20th, Dick Fosbury uh, uh, won the gold medal and uh, by, you know, revolutionized the world by literally turning his back on the establishment. <laughs> What, what, and he, he cleared a height. That height there is uh, seven, four and a quarter. We have it uh, there for you to see, give you some perspective. I, I give a free book to anyone who can jump that in any style. <laughs> you want to run a trip? No, okay. Uh, so a lot of people kind of know the basic story, the basic Fosbury story. Medford high jumper, couldn't jump, invents new style, wins gold medal. But a lot of people don't know the nuances that, that how much uh, how unlikely it really was that he would wind up on that medal stand. And, and in fact, I didn't even know until I started interviewing Dick about a year ago how amazing it, it was that he would, uh, would win the gold medal. I started getting interested in Fosbury when I was a kid. I grew up in Corvallis. Um, in fact, I just met a guy who was the son of Hal Moe, who, where are you? Right there, right in the front row, who was an a football, a assistant football coach and a track coach. Yeah, he, he wanted me to sign a book for his father, and I said, yeah, I live three houses away from him in Corvallis. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I grew up in Corvallis, and we would, on sun Sundays, we would ride our bikes over to Belfield and, and climb the fence and, and high jump in the same pit that Dick Fosbury had high jumped, because he was our hero. And this is a senior year of high school when Oregon State still had a uh, wood chip uh, landing area. Uh, that actually comes into play in the Fosbury story, as you'll note in a, in a few minutes. But at any rate, so I was interested in him as a kid. Uh, my, my bedroom is wallpapered in Sports Illustrated photographs. I'm totally into sports. I even stayed home and feigned illness once just so I could um, Fosbury flop onto my bed. My, <laughs> my father was a photographer, and uh, we, we had lots of these light stands in our house, and he was always also a boat builder, so we had lots of one by one molding and and one by two molding, and so uh, we uh, I was flopping on the bed, and then my mom went to run an errand that day that I was so yeah so called sick, and uh, it busted the slats on my bed, and uh, it's kind of hard to hide that from a mom when she comes home and your bed is like lying on the floor. But anyway, so I was always fascinated with Fosbury. Then in 1988. Uh, the 20 year anniversary of his gold medal, I wrote a piece for Sports Illustrated on him and uh, f drove to Sun Valley, Idaho and got to know him. And uh, then it seemed like I blinked and 30 years passed and I thought, wow, it would be great to write a book for the 50 year anniversary because I don't know that people know the story. And as I said, I didn't even know the real story. Um, just some quick background for those of you who don't know, today, our, my, my grandchildren, I have a pickup truck that has these little things like this. That it rolls the windows up. And, have you ever heard of these things? Anyway, so a lot of people, if you're under the age of 55, that's how you look at high jump. But you, you don't know there was ever any other way. But in fact, there was. And um, this is what it was. It was called the, uh, the straddle or western roll. And then Dick Fosbury, shown here, uh, 
invented the backward over the bar style and landing on his shoulders and neck, and you can imagine how hard that was. Uh, speaking of hard, um, it's fair to say that the Fosbury flop was born in uh, tragedy, in death, in um, uh, uh, angst. Because Dick Fosbury, when he was 14, his little brother, whoops, okay, we're racing away here. Hmm. Not quite sure. Can you get us? You, you want to press this oh. button. Oh, I see. That's we're going this way. Okay, so I got. I need to go back up to. Um, one, one more after that. Okay. Where is the one? Okay. Oh, oh my God. There, oh, that, that's that's supposed to do that. Let's oh, just let's just go that. beyond that. Let's just say that the '60s were happening. Oh. And let's just get beyond Where do you that. Go? Yeah. Just... Let's just go right there. Okay. Good. Okay, now let's resume. Okay. Okay, excuse me. Okay, so his, his, the, he, he and his brother out, he and his brother out riding bikes, and um, one of, and, and a drunk driver hits and kills his 10 year old brother, Greg. And uh, on the far left there, this is Dick, second from the right. And so the next year, his parents get divorced, partly because of this, which I believe 80 to 90 percent of cases. When a, ch a young child dies, the, the uh, uh, parents ultimately divorce. And then the following year after that, he's trying out for the football team in Medford. And D Bill Inyard, who would go on to play for Oregon State and in the NFL, uh, breaks through the line, cracks his helmet, and uh, busts two of his teeth. So football is through for him, too. So in three successive falls, Dick has lost sort of everything that was important to him. He can't play football. His parents are divorced, and um, th which is not the, you know, I, I get it. You can, you can um, in many cases, you know, people can get divorced and still be great parents, but that wasn't the case for Dick. His mom just stood outside and smoked cigarettes, uh, one cigarette after another, according to his sister Gail. She was not... She was having a hard time being the mom that Dick needed, and so Gail kind of became almost a mother figure for, for uh, Dick. And, um, and anyway, and he's got this guilt. He's got this guilt, the survivor's guilt, because not only did his brother die, but earlier in the day, on that day that he died, they had had a, uh, Bill had, or Dick had beat him up. And the bike ride was sort of an olive branch to say, hey, sorry about that. And look what happened. So you can understand a 14-year-old kid, this is pre-Vietnam, pre-PTSD, there's no counseling. He's never had a chance to talk about what went on. And, and the, the grief uh, uh, counselor that I interviewed for the book says, this is the defining moment in Dick Fosbury's life, but his parents have basically said, we never talk about Greg. We pretend that he never existed. So anyway, all I'm saying is that he was looking for some place to belong. And he was looking for some place that felt good because he had a lot of things in his life that were feeling bad and he had no place to, uh, uh, to, to. so he, he suddenly comes up with this new style. He goes to his coach and he says, uh, you know, coach, I'm terrible with the, with the straddle. And it's true. He was one of the worst high jumpers in the state. He was, he, 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 he was going five foot four, two feet less than that. And that, that's as high as he could go. And so he said, Coach, can I just try the scissors? The scissors is where you just come up sideways to the bar and just kind of go like this and get over the bar. Okay? And his coach basically says, well, whatever you want to do, Fosbury. Later, Dick would say the reason he said that was because he knew in a couple weeks I wasn't going to be on the team. So in other words, Dick needs to belong, but the only way that he can belong is to jump higher. And so the coach gives him the, the thumbs up to do the scissors, and Dick goes to the Grants Pass Rotary Invitational as a sophomore, 1963, and the opening height is five foot four. The fact that the opening height is his highest ever shows you how bad he was, because most of the other jumpers weren't even taking their sweats off till five eight or five or five ten. So anyway, Fosbury clears five foot four and survives that humiliation of get, you know, missing the opening height. But then in the midair at five foot six, he suddenly thinks to himself, lift your hips. You know, lift your hips. You always hit it with your butt when you miss. So maybe if you just lift your hips up. And so he lifted his hips up. And when he did that, he naturally had to lean back a little bit. 
And so he made it over. And he tried the same thing at five foot eight, and he made it over. He tried the same thing at 5'10", and he made it over. He improved six inches in an hour and a half, and he'd gone almost a year without improving. And he thought to himself, I'm on to something here, maybe. <laughs> so on the way back to Medford, the coach comes back on the bus and, and says to Fosbury, you know, I don't know what that was you were doing out there, but why don't you come in Monday morning, and we'll look at some film and see if we can find a model for you. Well, what the coach didn't realize is that he was sitting right next to the model. Because within uh, three, four years from that, or uh, five years from that, the entire world would be doing the Fosbury flop. Um, so in inter interestingly enough, four months after Fosbury's first incarnation of the flop, in August of 1963, a guy named Don Gordon walks into a patent office in LA. He doesn't know Dick, Dick doesn't know him. He walks into a patent office and files a patent for something called the Porta Pit. It's a, it's a, a, a collection of uh, chopped up foam blocks in a big net. And uh, it is so amazing that he hires people, trapeze artists and such, to jump from very uh, uh, high heights to show how great it is. This is one of those jobs where if you just have one bad day, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a really bad day. Um, how was work today, honey? <laughs> no. um, but anyway... And the, the serendipitous truth is that if Fosbury hadn't had foam to land on, he probably couldn't have done what he did because you saw what it was like to land on that sawdust on your neck and shoulders. So just as Dick Fosbury is inventing the Fosbury flop, a guy is inventing foam. What are the chances? Well, the University of Oregon is coached by a guy named Bill Bowerman. Where did Bill Bowerman go to school? Medford, and he was a coach there. He kind of was a foundation of, for, their, for their very strong athletic program. We used to call it the University of Medford when I was growing up in Corvallis at the time. And um, so Bowerman gets a, one of these early porta pits, and the next year when they, get a, they upgrade to a new one, guess who, what high school gets the, the, uh, the, the other one? Medford High. They're the only school in the state that has foam, and they're the only school in the world that has a flopper. Uh, so, anyway, that, that works out good. So, F Fosbury gets, breaks the school record at Medford. He's, he's good, he's not great, but he gets a half scholarship to, the or to Oregon State. He wants to be a civil engineer and becomes, comes to OSU just basically because he wants to be an engineer, civil engineer. But Bernie Wagner gives him a half scholarship, the track coach there, and, and, but he immediately tries to do what? Deprogram him. Turn him back into a straddler. Do it the way we've always done it. So this is the start of the generation gap, right? Bernie Wagner said, you know, whatever works, you know, what, what's worked in the past will work in the future sort of guy. And Dick Fosbury is a, hey, you know, I'm Harold in the Purple Crayon. You know, if I can't get over the bar, I'm just going to draw a new style. And um, so they, they, they have an interesting relationship, but Dick acquiesces and says, okay, I'll try the straddle. So they work a, a compromise where on, on, during the week, uh, Fosbury will learn to do the traditional style, the straddle, but on weekends to score points for the beavers, he gets to do the back layout. And he is absolutely frustrated, uh, Dick is, for the first year and a half. He doesn't know whether he's fish or fowl, flopper or straddler. His girlfriend in Medford breaks up with him. His, Greg, his gra grades are slipping. Uh, he's booted out of the Theta Chi house. Uh, Wagner threatens to pull his scholarship. He's also... Uh, fearful of the draft. It's, uh, of course, mid-60s. The war is escalating in Vietnam. Uncle Sam wants more soldiers, and Dick Fosbury, it's the 2.0 GPA is, the, is the, what you need to earn to keep your deferment, your student deferment, and Dick is having a hard time even clearing that. Finally, as a sophomore, he uh, goes over uh, uh, six foot 10 at Fresno, California, breaks the school record. Wagner finally waves the white flag and says, okay, whatever it is you're doing, let's just go with that. I don't think that the straddle's probably gonna work for you. And uh, it's always interesting, I learned as, a, as, as I researched the story, is the obvious thing is to look at Dick jumping over the bar, but I find it almost more interesting to look at the people looking at Dick. So look at these guys here. Like, what is this guy doing? Um, look at this shot at Oregon State. Now, if you, if you look at sports photography, unless it's a last-second shot or some 
incredible big moment in a sport event, a lot of people are doing other things than watching what's on the field or court. They're doctoring a hot dog, they're talking to each other, they're going up to go to the bathroom, they're balancing their checkbooks, they're doing something. Well, today, of course, they're, doing, they're just looking at their phones. We know that. You, you see the you know, behind home plate at Yankee Stadium, and it's like a third of the people might be watching the game. But when Dick Fosbury jumped, everybody watched. Look at the people behind him. Uh, and uh, so he finally goes, uh, he goes seven feet in January of 68 down in Oakland. And look at the guys behind him. They're like, who is this guy? You know, he's like an interloper. You know, who, who invited him to the party? So, uh, so the people that were least uh, uh, receptive to the Fosbury flop were, however, weren't, weren't the competitors, although they were skeptical. It was mainly the coaches. Coaches didn't like it because why? Because first of all, they, if their athletes wanted to do it, they didn't know how to teach it. They didn't know how to teach it. It was like some little kid coming in and saying, I want to learn to fly, but you know, the Wright brothers hadn't invented it yet. So anyway, uh, they, they were very skeptical and the, and the Europeans coaches were, were all the more skeptical. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so the Olympic trials are coming and in, and in 1968 they are held in a place called, uh, uh, a place called Echo Summit that's 7,300 feet in the Sierra Nevada mountain above Lake Tahoe. Why? Because the Olympics that year are where? Mexico City, 7,300 feet. So Bill Bowerman is put in charge of the high altitude training. We've got to have our athletes train at altitude because they're going to be competing at altitude. So he gets the idea to put a track in above South Lake Tahoe. And uh, the Forest Service says, you can do that, but you just can't take any trees. <laughs> so Bowerman finds a parking lot of a little uh, bunny ski slope and manages to pop a track in there. There's the high jump pit where the arrow's pointing. And uh, there's 100 trees in the middle of the track. It was, so watching a race at the Olympic trials <laughs> was a little bit like when you were a kid and you would have races. We used to have races around our house. And so like, like Billy would be leading going that way, but then Eddie would be leading coming out. It was the same way with Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan would be leading going back into the trees, but then you'd wait five seconds, eight seconds, and then Marty LaCorey would be leading coming out of the turn. So it was amazing. Or people would say, athletes would say, I would look up and there would be Bob Seagren like falling out of the sky like he was a timber topper or something, but he was just a pole vaulter who ha had to be tucked back in the trees there. And uh, it was a fascinating layout. Somebody said, Bill, Bill Toomey, the decathlete, said, if Zeus himself had, had decided to put in a track and field uh, venue, this is what he would have come up with. <laughs> At any rate, um, um, a fascinating place. John Radicic, a, a jumper for Oregon State, said it was so quiet you could hear your heart beat. He said, it's also the first place that I've ever measured my starting place for the high jump based on where a boulder was. <laughs> so anyway, so, but the USOC, the Olympic Committee, has decided they will choose the team in a two-tiered two, two uh, trials. One in LA in June, where the winners will all automatically qualify for the US team. And then in September, up here at altitude, they will choose the other two places. So Dick Fosbury goes to LA, he wins the, the high jump, and he comes back to Oregon absolutely pumped, I'm going to the Olympics. Well, Saturday night, after that first of the two-day meet, the USOC head sort of backs off that everybody gets to go if they win uh, a suggestion and says, well, they still have to prove themselves at altitude. And um, the, the, the athletes just say, well, what do you mean? You said the winners got to go. And they said, well, you've got to prove yourself. Well, what does it mean, proving yourself at altitude? Uh, that became a very, it's a very vague thing and nobody quite knew what it meant. But as the, as the, the they started, the 200 athletes gathered in Tahoe and started working out at high altitude. A number of them started thinking, hey, maybe the USOC is onto something here. Maybe we should throw out those uh, uh, LA results altogether because, you know, it would give them all a better chance. Only 18 athletes won and 172 did not win in LA. So the 172, it was in their best interest to have those results thrown out, right? And just choose the team at Echo Summit here. So they, uh, the USOC uh, allowed them to have a vote. This was a, 
remember the 60s, we the people, the rising up, we shall overcome, all that stuff. And so the USOC agrees to let them vote on it, and we'll surprise, nine to one, they vote to throw out the LA stuff. So Dick Fosbury comes back to Echo Summit, knows nothing of this, shows up and there's a note in the cafeteria door that says, um, we've changed how we're choosing the team, the LA results no longer count. So suddenly Dick Fosbury has to prove himself at Echo Summit. And he was, he was uh, beside himself with anger and frustration and, and you know he was a very cerebral jumper. He had been thinking about getting ready for uh, Mexico City in five weeks and instead he had to get ready to try to make the team again in one week. And he was literally down to his last jump at seven foot two here at, at uh, Echo Summit and uh, uh, was able to make it and then made 7-3 and made the team. But um, anyway, it was a very difficult, a difficult time for him. And I would argue that that was almost the more incredible athletic feat, what he did at Echo Summit, than what he did at, at Mexico City. Although he won the Olympic gold medal and when he went even higher, the pressure was so intense down here to, to even make the team. Um, these are his teammates, uh, Ronaldo Brown on, on his right and Ed Carruthers. Carruthers is a guy who said when he first saw the Fosbury flop, I just thought it was a gimmick uh, done by a hippie kid from Oregon. I never thought he'd be anybody I'd have to worry about. <laughs> anyway, I talked Fosbury into going down to Echo Summit because I said, I, somehow I just sensed that I want to start the book with you finding that place in the woods where you started your, your approach to, to, to the jump. And uh, anyway, so we, we were able to, using a laptop computer and, and photos of the past, we were able to find a year ago, September, the exact spot that Fosbury had jumped. So anyway, um, we also uh, took a look at Finette Island where Fosbury nearly drowned. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I would argue that what Fosbury did in Mexico City winning the gold medal was well, a little bit of a false summit because after the Olympic experience, he came back to Corvallis and um, uh, uh, did something that I think was, was even more heroic, I guess, and that is he stood up for a black Oregon State football player who had been kicked off the team. Now, let me give you some history. Dick Fosbury grew up in Medford, Oregon, which in the 1960s had sundown laws. A black person was not allowed to stay overnight. Um, they brought in a woman, Marian Anderson, one of the best opera singers in the world, uh, brought her in to have her entertain them, but would not let her stay in a hotel. She stayed with the school superintendent and his wife, who stepped up uh, and, and took her in. Um, so uh, this was the, the environment that Dick Fosbury grew up in. And he would say later, I never knew there was anything wrong with it. But competing with black athletes and, and becoming friends uh, with them uh, helped change his perspective. When John uh, Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their fists in Mexico City, uh, that didn't, wasn't meaningful to Dick Fosbury at the time because he was so intent on winning the high jump three days later. But later, when all the pressure was off, uh, when he started taking some sociology and pol uh, political and, and religious classes at OSU, started looking at the world differently, he said, I realized that I assume because I grew up in Medford that that was, the, that was par for the course. That's the way l the world should be. And, Suddenly, I started looking at things through a, a, a black perspective, and I realized, you know, their experience is different from mine. And um, Tommy Smith, you know, even in San Jose, could, was having a hard time finding housing. And so anyway, when this issue came up, 77 Oregon State athletes immediately signed a petition supporting DeAndros, the football coach, saying, yeah, it's right that Fred Milton be kicked off the team. Never mind that the, the no facial hair rule didn't seem to apply to white athletes who had sideburns that went on forever, like Steven Stills, remember his? Uh, but at any rate, they, they weren't kicked off the team, he was. And the, the, the black student union threatened to walk off campus. They said, this is about more than facial hair. It's about the, the athletic department having an unwritten rule that a black athlete can't date a white woman. It's about black athletes having trouble finding housing in Corvallis. Uh, it's about deeper things. Unfortunately, people don't tend to look at deeper things. They tend to look at symbols and get all riled up about that. And so seven athletes, though, stood up for Fred Milton, and among them was Dick Fosbury. Fosbury said, that was the day I became an adult. That was the day that I really think I grew up. 
And uh, you have to understand, he came back to Corvallis as a conquering hero. He could not buy himself a beer anywhere in Corvallis. Well, after that event with Fred Milton, he bought his beer nearly every time because a lot of people turned their backs on him. A lot of people said, you're being disloyal to Oregon State. And um, how dare you do that? And uh, so anyway, the other thing that Fosbury did was become what he would say, call a full human being. He said, after the Olympics, so many people wanted to pigeonhole me as just a high jumper. That was my new identity, and that's all I could be. And he said, I wanted to be a civil engineer. I wanted to be just a regular guy. And you know, people said, no, 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 you got to go compete in Europe. You need to jump higher than 7'4 and a quarter. You need to win the 72 Olympics. And um, th then he got an opportunity to become a regular guy because the dean of the, the uh, engineering department came and said, we'll let you re-enter. He had flunked out of school totally. Uh, and uh, we'll let you you'll come back on one condition, that you don't high jump anymore. Because it didn't work the last time, trying to do both. So Fosbury thinks it over, and he does it. He comes back, re-enters school, and spends two and a half years, and he gets his degree in civil engineering. And, and I think that's, that's kind of a, a cool thing that he did, because it, he, he realized that life was bigger than just jumping over a bar. And um, even though the, 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 the pressure was all just to be that, he wanted to be more. And so that, I think that's a great lesson that he teaches us. He got his degree. He went off and became a civil engineer in, in, near Sun Valley and, and has been that for 40 years. And uh, so anyway, what, what are the lessons that Fosbury uh, leaves us? I think the first of all is just the, the value of imagination that it's just hard to believe that a 16-year-old kid uh, rather than um, do something the way it's always been done, came up with a, a solution that, was, that would ultimately wind up revolutionizing the world. There were two other people that were high jumping backwards. One was Debbie Brill in Vancouver, BC, and a, and a kid whose name escapes me, but in Montana. Um, but they were, neither one of them were going as high as Dick was. And, and again, he, his timing was impeccable. He just had an amazing 1968 Ironic because for most people, 1968 is known as the year that everything went wrong. Uh, assassinations, uh, Vietnam, protests. It was, it was a tragic uh, de uh, year in many ways, but Fosbury, it was an amazing year. But anyway, so imagination, the idea that you don't have to do things the way they've always been done, you can even come up with a whole new solution. I, when I bring my high jump bar in here, uh, I tried it at one, one, one deal to carry that bar and uh, two uh, uh, you know, of the light stands and my uh, computer and my books and stuff, and I've got things. So I needed to invent, well, I'll just show it to you here. I need to, it needed to invent some way to carry it, and of course, I came up with this. You know, in the spirit of Dick Fosbury, I said, no, nobody, you just can't go online and get this. You know, I need I realize, and you're never going to find that on Amazon, but, but anyway, so imagination. Um, I think it's fa fascinating that a guy that won the Olympic gold medal when he was first, uh, he first got his name in the paper, they misspelled it. <laughs> anyway, and also, if you look right below the little blue arrow, there's a guy named Welch who was in the event the same day, but no relation to me. Oh, and the guy that won it, Bob Shepard, was the winner of the high jump on the day that Dick Fosbury first did the flop in 1963. And I thought, that'd be cool if I could track that guy down. And, and I tried and tried and tried, ultimately found that he used to live five houses away from me in Eugene and uh, did find him. But anyway. The other thing is the value of desperation. I know that's a weird, that sounds kind of strange, the value of desperation. And it's the idea that sometimes when we're desperate, we come up with the, the best solutions because we have no other choice. We're, our backs are to the wall. When I was down in Grants Pass, I heard this story about a, uh, 
I saw this, these two trophies, and I said, what, what happened here? And, and the athletic director told me that in 1948, a, uh, a, a Grants Pass High football team went to Portland, won the state football championship. The bus is heading back Saturday night. The, the, the town awaits the big celebration, but the bus driver swerves to miss something. The bus careens off the Sexton Pass Highway, Highway 99, and goes 200 feet down, explodes into flames. Two, two high school kids are immediately killed, and the rest are trapped in a burning bus. And they, they are desperate. They are absolutely desperate. One kid gets to the idea to take the trophy and use it to bust the windows out of the bus, and that's what saves the lives of everybody else on the team. So desperation, just like Dick Fosbury was desperate to belong, the only way that he could do it was to jump higher. He found a way, the Grants Pass kids found a way. Sometimes it's in desperation that we find the solution we need. Third is the value of dedication. Now Fosbury was never the first guy to practice or the last to leave, but he was dedicated to, um, to his style, to believing in, in that it could work. And in the same way that the Wright brothers were, the same way that uh, Robin Graham, the 16-year-old kid who sailed around the world uh, at the same time Fosbury was inventing the flop. These are people that just, they, they believe so strongly in what they're doing that they ultimately get the last laugh because of that. And so I, I, I think that he's someone we admire because there's so many times coaches didn't like it, uh, opposing coaches sometimes thought it was illegal, Medical establishment said people are going to break their back, and yet he continued to believe in what he was doing. Finally, just the value of re-education. Uh, the fact, you know, we don't do this too much in our world, and, and it, where we, we're, we're willing to go back and learn more and reevaluate and, and maybe set a different course, maybe look at things a little bit different, maybe change our perspectives. And Fosbury did that after the Olympics. And, uh, and I honor him for that. I mean, there are, it took humility to go back to school at a time when he's, you know, he's on the Johnny Carson show, he was on the dating game, he flew to Germany to have dinner with the head of Adidas. He had a lot of fame going on. To go back to school, there's, there, that, you really have to humble yourself you know, just to, to be a student. And yet, um, he, and, and the whole thing with black athletes, to sort of uh, look at his white privileged upbringing in Medford uh, in a new perspective, uh, I, I honor him for that. Right? So re-educate the value of re-education. Um, just things that we can, um, we can learn from. So anyway, uh, at, at that, I like to just open it up to questions. And, and you know, because Fosbury's story, I think, is one that um, I just don't think there's any other athlete like the guy around. And, uh, and uh, he also, you know, a lot, there's a lot of stories out there about poor athletes who become great athletes, but, but there's none like Fosbury's. It's because his isn't just about success, it's about sustainability. In that every time a young man or woman jumps over a bar backwards, a bit of Dick Fosbury goes with him or her. Uh, in 1972, four years after the Olympics, uh, already 28 of the 40 Olympic jumpers were doing the flop, and by 76, he'd completely revolutionized the world. Nobody uses any other style today except for the Fosbury flop. So, questions? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, my name's Karen. Uh, this doesn't take away from what he is and what he did and, and his success and what it brings to us. But in the 50s, when my husband was in high school, uh, there was a kid there who went over it backwards, too. Oh, really? Where, and where, was, whereabouts? And, uh, seaside. And he was told not to do it. I think he still did it. But, but you know, he, he wasn't good like... Like, yeah. Well, Dick right. wasn't good at the start. But, but he, he was good at this. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Is there a, a reason that you know why this uh, the flop works? Is it in physics or biology? You know, biology? Um, the the what a lot of people will say is it's uh, it 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 exploits speed in a way that the straddle where you kind of come up to the bar like this and then twist your way over you can't it 
It's really not dependent on speed. So it, it exploits speed. And, and if you're not particularly athletic, it's, it's a simpler way to get over the bar than the straddle was. And um, so, and the, the ease of learning it, that is, there was a guy from Indiana University in the kinesiology department that compared the two uh, uh, styles and basically said, none, neither is better than the other, but the Fosbury flop is easier to pick up and easier to learn. I would disagree. I would say that if the world record is now eight feet, a quarter inch, that's eight inches higher than that bar there with the Fosbury flop. And the highest a straddler's gone is seven foot nine. No straddler's won an Olympic medal since 1972. It seems to me like the Fosbury flop is a better style, but I'm not a kinesiologist, so what do I know? I, this is Solve. Yes. I've got the mic, sorry. It seems, I, I think to, to do this at all, you have to have pretty, you gotta be really tall, right, and have long legs. Not necessarily. It helps, but there's a guy named, um, I think, oh, I think his name was Franklin, what? Oh, anyway, so there's a guy that was, was five foot ten, and he's gone seven foot nine. He's gone twenty three and a quarter inches higher than his height, and he's not particularly tall. So, it, how old is Fosbury? Fosbury's I mean, how seven, tall. Tall. Uh, he's six foot four, in in college. He, he's five three now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. He's still, you know, if you saw pictures of him, he's he's in pretty good shape. He's seventy one. He's running uh, on Tuesday. He's running for county commissioner over in Bellevue, Idaho. So, he's a Democrat. Yes. <laughs> Ma'am, or? Oh, uh, uh, this is Carmen, and I um, wondered if what the name, exact name of your book is in case you sell out of those. <laughs> oh, okay, it's called um, The Wizard of Foz. The Wizard The, the Wizard of Foz, Foz. Dick, Dick Fosbury's One Man High Jump Revolution. Okay, and we were in Corvallis when he was there, oh, and my right? son was six, and right. he will get your book. Okay, <laughs> Thank great, you. great. I am, this is Casilla, I am now going to plead complete ignorance in the world of athletics. That's quite all right. Right. I have no idea, I have never seen a high jump, and I have absolutely no idea how a high jump is actually performed. Is this the same thing as pole vaulters, or do these people start with a, a, a standing stop, or what do they do? Uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna, well. Please explain. From two, yeah, that's not gonna work. Um, well, let me, let me try to For some reason, I can't get the thing to go back here. And can we? Yeah, can we get to an earlier slide? I don't know. Go back to the top. Um, right there. Or actually, the next one. There. Okay. So, so this is the. Uh, this is the straddle. That's the old way. And this is, the, this is the flop here. Come up like that, then you turn your back and flip over backwards like that. Does that, that help? <laughs> anyway, okay, uh, some more questions? Yes, B, over here. Okay. Over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. My name is Sally also. Uh-huh. But anyway, it looks to me like he could land on and break his neck. A Why? lot of people, a lot of people, oh, go ahead. Why does that not happen? <laughs> <laughs> that happens because Don Gordon invented the porta pit. You're landing on foam. Now, in, in, the, in the old days when they were landing on sawdust and wood chips, dangerous. But remember, he only had to do that for a couple of years. And as he got higher, uh, up beyond 6'6", six, 6'8", six, 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 he was then landing on foam rubber uh, landing pads that were safe. You, you saw the, the picture of the guy here who, oh, just a minute here, we're getting there. Um, 
okay, there, this guy's jumping from, you know, that's a good 40 feet and landing on this foam and he's surviving. And so foam rubber is pretty good, soft stuff to land on. Okay? Yeah. This is Ruthann. Uh, you mentioned that Fosbury gave up his jump, high jumping when he went back to school. Right. So you didn't mention anything what happened after school. Is he, did he continue doing anything? He, by by 19, spring of 1972, when he graduated, the Olympic trials were, were in Eugene, actually, and it was very convenient, but Dick was in such poor shape that he didn't even meet the qualifying standards to get into the Olympic trials. And so he did a little bit of pro jumping in 73. They started a pro uh, track circuit, but... He was always a, an emotional, cerebral jumper. He had, it had to matter to him, and somehow just the lure of money wasn't enough. He did not do well on the track, the pro track circuit, and he, he basically retired. The question I have is, um, yes. we're here. Did he, was he in demand as a, a high-jumping coach? I would think that with his being the innovator of, of the flop, I mean, and the other, the other coaches were uncomfortable with that, I would have thought he would have been the guy, the go-to guy for helping other jumpers. Yeah, I think a, a lot of people initially, you know, because he was the only one who was doing it, so yeah, he, had, he was barraged by people who wanted to know how to do it. And, but, but, but it's really, to be honest with you, it isn't rocket science. It's high jumping, and it's, it's, it's not that difficult. I mean, again, I was, I was doing it as a 14-year-old, as a and it's not that hard to kind of figure out how to do it. It's pretty simple jump. And, but the coaches were the most resistant because they are the ones who didn't, they didn't really know how to teach it. They didn't have any background. They'd never done it themselves. I mean, Bernie Wagner, his Dick's coach, couldn't really help him. It was, he was sort of a, 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 an independent contractor in a world of company men. Dick, Dick Fosbury had to figure it out for himself. He couldn't look at film with other people. He couldn't talk to other athletes and say, hey, what works for you? And Because and he was doing it by himself. He was, he was Robin Graham sailing around the world, in essence. And if something went wrong, he pretty much had to fix it on his own. So that's what, that just adds to the intrigue of the story. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, you've given away your age uh, because my kids are in their mid-50s, and they were nuts about the Fosbury flop. They all went out for track. Mm -hmm. They all did high jump. Actually, my, my youngest son could jump his height. His That's prob the problem is he got five foot six, is, is <laughs> a, a, adult height. But he definitely was a hero at, at that, particular, yeah, yeah. that particular time. And speaking of records, I'm told that you may have set a record attendance at ICL this morning. I'm told there's 124 here. Wow. But, but there's an asterisk. Well, don't, don't let it go to your head. I, I won't. I won't. The asterisk is we all met for ho uh, Halloween treats before <laughs> the... Anyway. I, yeah, I, I, it's hard to, to compete against sugar. I mean, yeah. This is Jim. Um, I don't know if you mentioned, you, you did mention the eight-foot record, or eight-plus. Yeah. And uh, did you mention who did that? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to... Actually, no, so I won't make you sweat it out. Uh, his name was Sotomayor, and he was a Cuban. Cuban, yeah. He broke it in the Salamanca Olympics in the mid-'90s. I don't remember 90, exactly. 93. 93? Yeah, 20, 25 years ago. And it's, so it's, it's, and that's a long time ago for... Yeah. And he actually broke his own personal record later on, but was not able to participate in the next Olympics because Cuba was um, banned. Yeah, and there are also... There are also um, some people who believe that you know that was kind of the rise of, of drugging and in, in sports, and maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. I, I, I'm just going to write about Dick Fosbury and leave it at that. But other, any other questions? Oh, one over here. So, in in writing, this is Franca. In writing uh, books on, on on interesting people, is it does the person need to be interesting because they fire you up, or just think that all oh, this will sell well? So, is there a criteria why 
and how you select well, your the, subject. The, the fact that nobody outside of this room has really heard of my books would suggest <laughs> that um, <laughs> that I I kind of go I go where my heart takes me. Um, somebody said if you really want to make write, w money writing books, you find some genre that everybody loves, and then you just modify it a little bit each time like John Grisham with, with uh, courtroom stuff. And I've been just the opposite. I just go with whatever sort of catches my fancy. I've written about hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. I've, when I became a grandfather, I wrote kids' books. Uh, so I do a little bit of everything. So for me, the satisfaction, although I admit, I'd love to, I'd love to you know, be able to pay off those college loans. Um, <laughs> the satisfaction is in the people and, and, and uh, to write about inspiring people is, uh, it's just a, a privilege to be able to further their stories because then you have that nurse who calls you and says, I became a nurse because of Francis Slanger. Or, you know, to see that, you know, some kid who had no confidence in himself or herself, they went on to greatness because they did well in high jumping and maybe they read your book or something. So, to me, that's, the, that's what stokes me about writing is the, the connection you can make with the, the reader and, and that you can inspire people with a story. So, and I'm, I'm excited about this, this uh, uh, Vietnam nurse book because I think it has the potential uh, to do that same sort of thing. So. I'm wondering, since we have a little time left, if there was anyone who was waiting to ask a question before we had the break and we didn't get to it because, and now we've turned to another subject. Was there someone with something they want to contribute or ask about? Uh, this is Jim again. Yeah. You mentioned the Vietnam Memorial, and uh, when I visited the memorial, I thought the most moving part of it, and it's not really part of it, but it's the nurses. Right. I think there are three nurses sort of in a circle. Yeah, four. With the yeah. wounded mm -hmm. soldiers. Yeah. And I thought that was very that's, moving. That's what the woman fought 10 years to have put in. Because, you see, they put the wall in, and then, then the... the uh, uh, vets said, that's great, that honors those who died, but what about those of us who fought and lived? What about what's there for us? And so then they did a, a, a commission, a, a memorial of three males, and then uh, Diane Evans Carlson said, hey, wait a minute, you know, a lot of women served as nurses, we deserve a statue, and that began a 10-year fight that basically only a, an episode of, of 60 minutes turned the tide at the end, and they, they got the memorial. And that's the, exactly the one that you're talking about. So, in fact, I'm going in uh, two weeks, uh, Veterans Day, there will be uh, the 25 year anniversary of that. I guess that happened the same year that um, the guy broke, the, the, uh, set the world high jump record, 25 years ago. And so they're honoring the, the woman who I'm writing about 25 years later. A few more questions? Yes, here. Not a question, okay. just a compliment. That was a wonderful, wonderful morning. Oh, well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. You guys are a uh, very vivacious audience. Thank you.